Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Interval. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Ah, oh, thank you. Thank you. It's, uh, we're, we're so happy to have you here. Uh, it's, we, we have these occasions sometimes when we're not only presenting a program we're really proud of, but it's actually a, a project of Long Now. It's work that Long Now um, has, uh, is, is part of our mission and, and part of uh, the folks we work with every day. So it's really exciting to have Ben uh, talking today. And um, we're, um, yeah, you're, you're in for a real treat. Um, uh, I'd like to ask Stuart Brand, co-founder of Long Now, co-founder of Revive and Restore, to come up and give an introduction for tonight's speaker. Thanks, Michael. So if you get the New York Times, so it's Tuesday, so it's Science Times Tuesday. And on page two, there's a quote that's taken from an article in Science Magazine that came out this week on de-extinction. And the quote is, if this is always going to be a zoo animal, then stop. The goals have to be about ecological restoration and function. The quote is by Ben Novak, the speaker tonight. <laughs> How is it that Ben's being quoted in the New York Times and Science Magazine? When this animal went extinct just over a century ago, nobody could believe it would happen because there had been billions of them, maybe five billion in North America, it's the most abundant bird in the world. Everybody said, yeah, it's being hunted, it's terrible, but it will never go extinct, there are so many of them. So when they did go extinct, and I remember my mother telling me about this in the Midwest, it not only broke everybody's heart, it shocked everybody into realizing that continental animals could go extinct. Up till then, only island animals, like the dodo had, or the great auk had been known to go extinct. And so these birds probably saved the bison, which were in the process, the next continental animal that was being hunted to extinction. So as a result of this iconic quality, in 2012, when I was on the stage for a salt talk with Tim Flannery, a biologist from Australia, in the Q&A, for some reason I just said, hey Tim, what if we brought back the passenger pigeon? We were sort of talking about the far out idea of de-extinction. And he said, strong arm to you, might and uh, go ahead and do it. So I wrote uh, George Church, the biotechnologist at Harvard who uh, might be able to do such a thing since he'd mentioned it in his book, Regenesis. He said, sure, let's do it. Uh, Ryan Phelan, who now directs Revive and Restore and will run the Q&A, uh, put together a meeting at Harvard about bringing back the passenger pigeon with various specialists, one of whom um, got in touch with some random kid who turned out was wild about pigeons named Ben Novak, who then got immediately in touch with George Church, who got in touch with us. We then hired Ben Novak without actually meeting him, sort of <laughs> as an intern to go intern at George Church's lab at Harvard Medical School and learn about the next level of, uh, of dealing with biotech for ancient DNA. And one thing led to another to eventually he was coming out here to go to UC Santa Cruz, and while he was doing the science across all of the various projects Revive and Restore was doing, he was also getting a master's at UC Santa Cruz. And uh, just this year, he got his master's degree. Ryan and I were there, practically moved to tears, like you know, some parents, oh God, he's grown up. <laughs> and it was pretty interesting, because a lot of the heavyweight scientists at UC Santa Cruz were there being very impressed by what his research had turned up that was serious news about the passenger pigeon. And that's what you're about to hear tonight, Ben. Am I on? Am I on? All right, everyone can hear me fine? All right, so I'm gonna go right in my talk. I, I very rarely finish these on time, but tonight is going to be an exception. Um, so, some of you may have been at Stuart's Salt Talk back in 2013. Anybody in the room hit that? Yeah, there we go. And we've been talking about this project for a while. Everything in Stuart's introduction happened in 2012, and we went public in 2013 with a series of talks. Um, Stuart on TED, and then we had our big event, TEDx the Extinction, where the world finally got to see me and my bad hairdo for that day. <laughs> um, and uh, this eventually led to, uh, corresponded with the National Geographic magazine up on the wall over there. 
that came out about de-extinction, and so, I mean, then the world's conversation about passenger pigeons and whether or not we should bring them back started. No project happens with one person. I lead the project, and what that means is I functionally do the least amount of work and try to find the best people to do the rest. Um, all of these people uh, and these institutions have played a vital role in making everything we're going to talk about tonight happen. Most of all, Ryan and Stuart right there. So the last three years of research, what have we been doing with, uh, with Long Now's time and money? Well, we've been doing genetics, paleoecology, and you're not really supposed to care about the images that are on this slide, but I do want to point out that this right here is an actual visual representation of the entire passenger pigeon genome. That, it, that represents 990 million base pairs of DNA in a single figure. Uh, and so it's a very important figure, not yet published, but uh, that is one of our most important figures in our research so far. And you can ask me about that when the talk is over. So it was brand new news a little while ago that band-tail pigeons were the closest relative of passenger pigeons and not mourning doves. So subsequently, the last century, no one had ever bothered comparing passenger pigeons and band-tailed pigeons. So that's something we had to do brand new for the first time, um, comparing skull measurements and other things related to my work and relating that to dietary ecology. So all of this over the last three years eventually culminating in, in <laughs> that proud moment. That's my selfie from the bleachers after getting my my degree. You can see my, uh, you can get my master's thesis online if you look it up. It's not the best piece of written material. The new publications will be better. But the thing is, something to know about extinct animals is if anything goes extinct before 1830, there's been no scientific treatment of it whatsoever. Ecology wasn't a science until the 1930s. So even though there are a century of publications on passenger pigeons, no one had treated them scientifically in a modern way. And that's what the real goal of rewriting the history of the passenger pigeon was. And I want to start out with chapter one, and it's supposed to be a, a coy and vague title for a reason. What is de-extinction? This is Revive and Restore's definition of de-extinction. This is not yet published, but this is the definition of de-extinction. De-extinction is a form of ecological replacement by means of purposefully adapting a living organism to serve the ecological function of an extinct species by altering phenotypes through means of breeding or genome editing. I know it's wordy and horrible, but we have to be this way in science. The goal is ecological function. So what was quoted in New York Times. That's, that's the real goal for us. Might not be for everybody, but that's what it is for us. So de-extinction can happen in a number of ways. As I said, through breeding, trying to recapitulate the phenotype of an extinct species using some living species, such as the quagga project that's been going on since the year I was born, or the aurochs project in which they're using the actual descendants of an extinct species, the aurochs, to bring back together the genes that have now gone through independent lineages. Or, if you have no living relative that you could breed in the right way or no descendants that you could breed in the right way, our approach with genome editing for some of the most unique animals in the past. Now, this is not exactly brand new. The world's first engineered organism is the red canary, which was done back in the 1920s and 30s through breeding. Engineering is technically just bringing the genes of one organism into another organism. So a few people bred yellow canaries with the red siskin, birds that are, com are very distantly related, and you get this representation of a genome. This is what I want you to focus on right here. One chromosome from one parent, one from the other. And then they rebred those, and when you rebreed, you get recombination, and so you get this little mixed chromosome for the first time, this very new hybrid chromosome with some from the red siskin and some from the yellow canary, and then you start interbreeding those offspring one generation at a time until you have just the traits you want left over, and you get a bird that's red, but is a canary. I want you to pay attention to that genome because people often tell me that what we're doing is somehow novel and brand new, and it's never been done before, and it's so unnatural, but look at the genome of what a de-extinct passenger pigeon looks like. We're just moving the genes of one organism into a related organism for those selected traits 
just like was done almost 100 years ago with the red canary. We're just doing it with, so, with modern technology that we can get that DNA from a bird that's no longer alive. Now, there are natural analogs to this. This is not something that's just in the engineering realm. Red wolves are actually hybrids of two species. They're not a species that evolved on their own. When people sequence the genomes of those wolves, sometimes they're 75% coyote versus wolf. Beth Shapiro's lab has been working on polar bears for a long time. It turns out almost every living grizzly bear in the world has polar bear genes from hybridization events that happened 30,000 years ago. And those polar bear genes have been acted on by selection for various re reasons. And this is the one I really want people to take home, all of us tonight. <laughs> How many of us are from Africa? Originally? Uh, not, or, not originally. <laughs> not originally. Genetically African. Okay. You're actually not. Don't fall into that trap. Because you're not genetically African, because once people left Africa, they ran into someone called a Neanderthal, and everyone here in this audience tonight is a hybrid. So however pure we want to view ourselves, or however we pure we want to view nature, it's not simple. We are all hybrids. That hybridization event happened 45,000 years ago, and evolution has kept traits that work for us from Neanderthals and gotten rid of ones that don't. So what is the origins of the original passenger pigeon? That's what we're going to talk about. So think about that de-extinction, but let's think about the passenger pigeon as a whole now. It's evolutionary history. And the reason I'm opening up this way is because this is the long now. So we want a long view. So let's go back 15 million years. And this is a completely made up bird that I painted. Um, Columba patagynus progenitor, or the, the, uh, the creator of the American pigeon. So, a bird that might have looked like this existed 15 million years ago. That we do know. And what's special about that bird is it arrived in North America and it began a cascade of really interesting events over the last 15 million years. 12 million years ago, it made a split into two different lineages. And the lineage down the west coast, where we're at right now, spawned the band-tailed pigeon. You might have seen some of these in your backyard every once in a while or out hiking. And those ba that lineage continued on down into South America and diversified into multiple species into all of the different environments that exist there. And there's so many species that diversified that I had to split this up into two animations um, because there was a couple different waves of evolution that occurred, creating 17 different species in 12 million years. And that's incredible. That's absolutely incredible. But arguably, what's more incredible is what was going on with that one population in Eastern North America all that time. What was going on? Something really incredible happened here. A bird that started out breeding the way any other bird starts out had an evolutionary awakening. And all of a sudden, birds that are territorial decided to start being colonial and nesting near each other. This allowed them to take advantage of the forests that were very expansive and perform larger, denser flocks. It also increased their need to develop social selection schemes. If you're competing for mates next to a lot of other males, you need to be showy. I think a lot of us know that tonight. <laughs> and this creates one of the only sexually dichromatic pigeons in North America, and one of less than possibly 20 or so in the world, which eventually becomes the bird that we know today that lived in that range, and the birds that you're seeing here tonight. <laughs> males with red breasts and blue wings, So how do we know this? How do we know this? Well, a few years ago, some people sequenced some DNA, notably Beth Shapiro's lab, and they found how the passenger pigeon was related to all of these other North American pigeons. And, but what they didn't know was that was when all of this stuff happened. So Andre Suarez and I sequenced the genomes of a bunch of other pigeons, including the dodo, and, and these are mitochondrial genomes. It's a funny thing, just look that up on your phone. Um, and we were able to time this event of pigeon radiation, about 12 million years between those species. Well, what's been happening, the environments have been slightly consistent, so we looked at the environments of where band-tailed pigeons live here in the west, and passenger pigeons in the east, and the Rocky Mountains form a large barrier, and the Great Plains form a rather consistent, somewhat permeable barrier over the last 12 million years, while forests were continuous. So we synthesized that all together to make the story that I gave you just now. And on to the next chapter. 
So you now know how the passenger pigeon came to be. Now we're going to talk about what the passenger was, p pigeon was doing once it had that evolutionary awakening. And it's, it's a really key thing. Observed in the 1800s was this phenomenon that you have a patch of closed forest and a band of a billion, two billion passenger pigeons, give or take a hundred million, come through and they do what pigeons do. They poop a lot. But because there's so many, they actually break trees, break branches, because they're trying to find places to stay. They, and the reason that it's believed they have the name passenger is because there were so many that they would crowd and land on top of each other as passengers. Um, and as they settled, eventually a region of forest, sometimes up to 30 square miles, sometimes up to, to 800 square miles, that, that was the largest event, averaging 30 square miles, would be just absolutely devastated. And as modern people, we think that's an absolutely horrible thing. How could that be good for the forest? Well, devastated forests undergo regeneration. And they offer new homes to a variety of animals that closed canopies don't, producing this type of system. Successional types of habitat, from the disturbance back to closed canopy in which different species utilize at a time. So the same patch of land can temporally hold more species than any individual habitat at any given time. Now, what passenger pigeons were doing for the past 50,000 years was moving nomadically from one patch of forest to another every few weeks doing this. So the tens of millions of square miles of forest of the eastern United States was being constantly seeded with these new habitats, creating a mosaic of, of regenerating forests. That means you had mature stand next to a recently regenerating stand next to a middle stand. So it created a large habitat that was just prime for most species that live there today. How do we know this? This was the main thing missing from the passenger pigeon story. People have speculated about natural history and ecology a great deal, but without being able to sequence DNA and do population genetics, we could never really get to the heart of the passenger pigeon's history. So what have I been doing for three years? We've sequenced the mitochondrial genome, this little tiny circular piece of DNA that you get only from your mother. Mother's in the room? Yeah, you guys are genetically more important than men. Um, and we can, because you only get it from the mother, we can figure out relationships very nicely. We have it from some published data that we didn't do. It's always nice when someone pays the bills for you. Um, but we have toe pads such as from this bird right here. So it, we, I can take a tiny little cutting from the toe of this bird, about the size of a pinhead, and get the entire genome about 10, 20 times over. Um, not just that genome, I mean the entire genome. We have a couple from the 1690s, and really amazingly from bones like that, we have 4,000-year-old DNA from passenger pigeons. Now, we might have 10,000-year-old DNA. Might. We haven't dated the bone, but we have a mitochondrial genome that we haven't included in any of our analyses because we haven't paid for dating the bone yet because we have just enough bone left for one dating run. <laughs> They're very light, and we're, we keep debating, are we going to do this? Um, but it might be 10,000 years old. And it's identical to the ones from the 1800s, which is pretty astounding. So what is passenger pigeon history, population history? There's been some ideas. This absolutely ludicrous idea that they became abundant only when Europeans disturbed the habitat, published in the book 1491 by a guy who probably didn't read anything else. <laughs> and this published curve that starts out based on population genetics, but based on an erroneous calculation, and then ends with the idea that they were dependent on oak trees. So oak trees were not prevalent until 10,000 years ago. So that's the idea that they boomed up then. We put together a hypothesis that if they were dependent on the types of forest they bred in in the 1800s, that maybe that's the curve, or maybe just the ice age dipped them and then they came back, something like that. We had all these hypotheses with great reasoning, and we felt really confident that we would know the story until we got this back. And we spent several months wondering what the hell that means. Um, this is actually not even truly real. What we've discovered from the nuclear genome and the population genetics is that, one, passenger pigeons have been extremely abundant. The number up there is approximately a, an effective population size. That's a genetic population size of 7 million. Someone here guessed for me the genetic population size of human beings. 
who have 7 billion people on the planet. It's, from, it's between 10 and 15,000. And theirs is 7 million. That's bigger than any other published bird to date. And it's been that way, you'll notice, pretty consistently for 20,000 years. They, they don't react to anything that's changing in the environment. And this was the key thing that changed our understanding about the bird. Now, what, it has this special date here of 45,000 years they went up and down. But what we've learned from the nuclear genome is that's a, f that's a screwy date. So uh, <laughs> that's an evolutionary selection date. That is not a population date. Odds are what was happening is these birds were abundant for hundreds of thousands of years, and the genetic diversity was going up and down while the population wasn't. And it's a very neat phenomenon that we'll be publishing in our paper that was predicted in the 70s, and this is the first real-world data that, that proves that phenomenon. When you're abundant, it shapes you. So what do we do with that? We have that key piece of information. So we've been relating it to diet. We've been relating it to changes in the habitat over the years, creating a synthesis of what this bird was doing and what it was like. Going over other published literature on this bird and going, okay, now that we know this new thing, what does it mean based on what they were saying? And it turns out all the data you would ever need, don't even bother reading that. <laughs> I'm just showing you that I did a lot of work. Um, <laughs> All the data you would ever need to put together the natural history of a passenger pigeon exists in some other study that never bothered to talk about pigeons. Things about uh, uh, interacting ecosystem drivers in oak forests, disturbance dependence histories of different tree species, uh, the, the early value of early successional habitats to eastern forests, uh, disturbance dependent bird conservation, etc. All this stuff, you read through it all realizing something about passenger pigeons, and you come to these kind of major points. One, passenger pigeons were ecologically resilient. That's that straight curve, going through ice ages and changes in habitat and not even blinking. They were superb generalists. That's why they were so re resilient. Their dietary impacts shaped forest evolution. That's the main point of my thesis. And their abundance made them ecosystem engineers of that mosaic system. And that's been their role for this ongoing bit of time. And that's the reason we want them back. Why? Today, well, no, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Between 1800 and 1914, <laughs> this was going on. You have your billions of birds. And because they were so easy to shoot and net, eventually they go extinct. Now. Recent research shows that it is human harvest that is the major force that caused the extinction of these birds, not deforestation, not any other impact, not some behavioral issue in the birds. Don't believe most of the stuff you've heard about passenger pigeons because as we've just shown you tonight with this new data, we've learned most of it's not true. And even though it's really sad, I just kind of smile, that little train going by <laughs> full of pigeons. Food. So in the 1800s, and I'll, I'll just take this aside quickly, the meat markets were fueled by wild game, and that's because you have an influx of immigration making the population, human population boom without the establishment of ranches and farms on the scale that we have today. Those were just growing. So most of the protein that was going to the markets was wild game. And at the turn of the last century, Almost every large game and game animal in the eastern United States was, was almost gone. People don't understand that. Deer, which are seen as a pest, could not be found in the forests of Appalachia in 1903, practically, because they hunted everything. These were so abundant that they were easy to get a lot of at once, and they just happened to be the first extinction in, in line, which is why all those other species did not go extinct. What's happened since then, there's been heavy amounts of deforestation, but something really cool is despite the fact that the human population has skyrocketed, you'll notice that reforestation has really come back. There are places, the eastern forests are virtually at the same forest cover today as they were in about 1830, um, which is really impressive. But it's slightly different habitat, and there's a reason for that. Without any more disturbances, we've suppressed fire, we've suppressed any type of disturbance, all of those successional habitats are disappearing. And so despite having more habitat today than for 100 years, all those species are in decline. And what you'll find in the literature is that most of our, our iconic species of eastern North America will be extinct within the next century in the eastern United States. 
no matter how much you protect the habitat, no matter how much you do to restore that habitat manually, those will go extinct in certain places and likely will go completely extinct in the East United States, simply because we now have closed canopy forests that are different than they used to be. So the reason we believe, and I believe very firmly, I think the data supports it, that we want passenger pigeons back is they can do this scale of engineering, producing these environments that we could never do on the scale that's needed. We can burn, we can chop, we can do whatever we want, but you know what, I drove by, uh, I, I live down by Monterey, drove by a fire this morning, controlled burns, do you really want that in your backyard? The alternative is cleaning up some poop every once in a while. <laughs> I mean, between burning your house down or cleaning off poop, I, I mean, I think it's, it's pretty obvious. So how are we gonna do this? Engineering the engineer. I'm actually gonna finish way ahead of time. This is good. <laughs> um, this is the basic process we've developed over the past few years of how any form of avian genetics will work. We have to go from informatics, sequencing DNA and figuring out what genes matter, and then we need to put those genes into a cells, get those into birds, breed up those birds, and so on. And it's much more complicated than that. These have to be, for birds especially, they have to be a very special type of cell called a primordial germ cell. And even though I'm not talking about heath hens tonight, I'm going to bring them up for the fact that Revive and Restore's heath hen de-extinction project is making really good advancements in developing these resources. They've been proven, this is the technique used to engineer domestic chickens, and it hasn't gone beyond the chicken because no one in the world has ever needed, and needed to go beyond chickens for their work, but we want to bring this into the realm of endangered species, extinct species, and it's not easy, but the heath hen might be the first to prove, make some real, break some real ground there. But following that will be pigeons. You can ask me why the pigeon is behind right now, and it's, it's unique traits of the bird. It's nothing, it's no, no sign, it's not, it's not some sort of obstacle preventing us from going there first. It's just heath hens are easier. <laughs> so, my goal, I have the picture of a bandtail pigeon here, but I really hope we actually put those engineered bandtail pigeon cells into rock pigeons because they're easier to work with in captivity. We'll grow up a whole bunch of passenger pigeons when you breed those chimeras. So essentially you have a bird that's a rock pigeon, and on the inside it's growing the gametes of an engineered passenger pigeon. Breed a male and a female, you get the passenger pigeon for the first time in 120 years or so. And then we start working with them in captivity, acclimating them to the wild. I want my birds to be our birds. <laughs> it's very close to me. Um, I want our birds to be wild from the moment they're hatched, so I don't want them to grow up in a laboratory setting or an aviary setting. I want them to be growing up exposed to weather um, in very controlled settings, but settings that are actually just netted areas of forest. Um, and that's going to be key, I believe, to getting that set up preconditioning, et cetera, and eventually we'll take down those nets and let them fly and they'll get to rediscover themselves in their habitat and start doing for us what they used to do in the past. Uh, I believe it'll only take about 10 years with the right adequate of resources and money from the point where we start breeding these birds. It could take less than 10 years to get a population of 10,000. 10,000 is arguably perfectly fine to make a sustaining population. People believe we need billions of these birds for them to sustain, and that's, that's kind of lunacy for two reasons. One, there's no evidence in the past that passenger pigeons required large flocks to live. But two, this is not the passenger pigeon of the past. The genetic basis that forms this bird is a band-tailed pigeon, birds that live in flocks of 10 or 20, a bird that has a population of about 2 million total right now. It's not a bird that needs large flocks to live. And what we've learned about the genomes, which I think is really amazing, what I was alluding to earlier, is that if we give these birds the, the essence of the passenger pigeon, we give them the, the kickstart they need, the traits we want to include to create this bird, this new bird, Patagynus neoectopistes, <laughs> the new wanderer of America, if we give it this, these traits, it'll assume the evolutionary trajectory that happened 12 million years ago. And even though that bird does not have necessarily the complete genome of a passenger pigeon from 1860, passenger pigeon genomes have a very unique signature. It's not inherent in what the A's, T's, C's, and G's are. It's inherent in the diversity across that genome, and it's made, it's formed by a history of abundance. 
So when these new birds that can start off at a small flock become abundant, I guarantee you that the Ben Novak of the future, who may be Benita Novak or who knows, um, when they sequence DNA from these birds, they will have the same genomic signature as they did in the past. And that will be the true recapitulation of de-extinction. And that's why it's a long now project. So what have we been doing? Let's give you the more technical view. In 2012, I got on board with uh, Revive and Restore with DNA from three passenger pigeons. Um, and that's the only reason I really got my job. <laughs> that's what's missing from this is I came to the board with something no one else had. <laughs> privately owned passenger pigeon DNA <laughs> that was not, had no strings attached to an institution, but it had one string attached, and that was me. Um, and we used those samples to figure out some aspects of passenger pigeon DNA quality, which then would set us up for working with Best Lab later. We attempted a band-tailed pigeon genome that summer at George Church's <laughs> lab, and me, having never done it before, didn't do the best job in the world, so that genome didn't become the reference genome, but it is very, being very valuable to our research today. When I came to Beth's lab, we sequenced DNA from 41, 42 passenger pigeons <laughs> um, to start doing uh, this work. I did DNA extractions of 87 individuals, three of which turned out to be rock pigeons, <laughs> um, which was cool, I'll write about that, but uh, it was disappointing, to say the least. Um, and, and we've sequenced two complete nuclear genomes. Now, the other paper that published genomes did genomes too, so we actually have four complete nuclear genomes of the passenger pigeon. Uh, we might have five in a few weeks, and the more you can have, the easier the work actually becomes. So the actual reference genome of the band-tailed pigeon uh, first started sequencing in early 2014, and it was a disaster. It was actually easier to work with the dead birds than it was the living birds. It, we failed seven times in two months, and that is very disheartening. But this is, not like, this is not unique to me being a novice at that point in time. This is just, if you ask anybody who does this work, they're gonna be like, yeah, we had this one animal and it just would not work at all. Um, but by early 2015, we finally, with the help of Dovetail Genomics down in Santa Cruz, had one of the world's best reference assemblies at that time. It's still not published, but it was one of the world's best. They've continued to top themselves at every turn, though, so it's no longer one of the world's best, but it's very close. Um, our, our greater prairie chicken genome of the Heath Hen Project actually was one of the first genomes they did and, had, and beat out the domestic uh, chicken at the time. That was awesome for us. Uh, so, so we began mapping these genomes to chicken genomes and other things, trying to figure out chromosomal patterns, all things that don't really matter right now, um, but are scientifically important. And we figured out very early on, and this number will be revised, but we figured out that there are 25 million mutations between the, the band tail pigeon and the passenger pigeon. We're after the 10 to 100 mutations that actually work on those traits. It's important to remember that in 12 million years, a lot of mutation builds up that means nothing, and here's why. Is anyone here tonight not a human being? <laughs> no? No one's a different species? You expect us to admit it? <laughs> <laughs> Some of you have a lot more Neanderthal DNA than others. Um, no, no. We all consider ourselves human, but between every single one of us are thousands of unique mutations, some of them significantly large, and we don't view ourselves as a different species. Now, and that's because in hundreds of thousands of years of being human, you get unique mutations and they don't affect anything that makes you human. They affect things like the size of your eyebrows or the receding hairline you have. This is not receding, by the way. <laughs> My wife keeps telling me I have a receding hairline. It's been like this since I was four years old. <laughs> this is just it. So, 25 million mutations, that's just grown over 12 million years of time. Evolution only acts on the ones that really affect key traits. So it might only be three or four genes that influence colonial behavior. We've actually identified one of the genes involved in making the red breast. And that comes from the red canary genome research that other people did, and that's one of the reasons I brought it up tonight. So in 2000, late to, early 2016, late 2015, we began uh, 
finishing the final draft and began actually discovering where those genes are. It turns out that's a laborious thing to do. Uh, you can find them by their sequence, but finding them, it's, it's, just, it's a pain. And I'll never do that again. I'm, I'm outsourcing that. I'll never do that again. People, other people, you can outsource it. If you can outsource it to people who are better than you, pay the extra money. So, in 2015, Crystal Bioscience, another Bay Area lab that's pioneering gen, uh, gene engineering in chickens, um, they're one of the only labs in the world that's ever had success in culturing cells of birds other than chickens. And we are partnering with them on our heath hen project, and we want to partner with them long term on, pa on the passenger pigeon project. So they began a pilot study just figuring out if you're working with pigeon eggs rather than chicken eggs, what's the best way to do it? And so they identified what stage to harvest cells. Haven't grown any successfully yet, but that's our next push, is getting to the point where we can supply them with enough funds so that they can figure out how to culture pigeon cells. And we're negotiating with potential partners at Texas A&M right now for developing a pigeon flock to be used for this type of research. Because once we have the cells, that doesn't really do us much good if we can't make those cells into a bird again. A lot of work goes into that. About, we assume that right now that about five years of research would need be needed for that project, and possibly anywhere from $500,000 to a million dollars would pay for that segment of research and really open up the field for a lot of other birds. That's the bottleneck technology for avian de extinction as a whole. So if you want to see dodo birds or great auks or anything else, we got to invest in that technology, and the passenger pigeon could be the one that really opens up the door after the heath hen, for various reasons. We did a, a really great study with a man named Paul Marini, who uh, is a very uh, quietly spoken man who you wouldn't believe his achievements by meeting him, but anyone ever eaten turkey or chicken in the room? So like 80% of the chicken and turkey uh, the markets in the United States are derived from a line that Paul Marini bred, um, selected for traits. He was a quantitative geneticist, and he sits down and he says, Ben, you know all this genetic stuff much more advanced than I do. And I'm like, no, I don't, Paul. <laughs> um, but he loved birds and he wanted to help, so he set up an aviary and he bred two pairs of bantail pigeons from Sal Alvarez for six months to figure out, can you get them to lay more eggs? What can you do? And this was very valuable for us because when we're going to breed these birds, it's what let me say we could get 10,000 in 10 years. And we have a report on that online. And of course, with all that DNA work we were doing, I was putting together ecology over the past three years, figuring out that history of abundance and what it really means all the way to the end of two th early 2016, where we finally interpreted their full niche. That's what we've been doing. What do we want to do next? In, there we go. It would have been nice in 2016 to get this started. We haven't yet, we're still talking to partners, but we want to start that cell culturing experiment with rock pigeons and eventually moving that into working with band tail pigeons. Um, the key experiment we want to do first is if we can get cultured rock pigeon cells, we want to turn, we want to create some, uh, uh, test those in rock pigeons. We then want to create band tail pigeon cell lines and pass them through rock pigeons. That will be a key, key first step. If we can get a band tail pigeon to hatch from a street pigeon's egg, then we have proven we can make a passenger pigeon. And once we've done that, we can start genome editing experiments in those cells. We can start introducing the traits that we feel are the ones that are going to be important for passenger pigeons. And over the course of a few years in a cell line, we can do hundreds of generations that would have been happening in real bird, I mean in live birds, introduce those into a single generation of parents and leapfrog forward in evolution, so to speak, until we have a breeding flock sometime maybe around 2022, where we can start Come on, there we go. Um, start propagating them at multiple locations. We have some volunteers that do pigeon racing, people who are award-winning pigeon racers who are interested in helping us out with this now. And, of course, moving to the closed habitats. This is how the pink pigeon was restored in the wild in Mauritius. I just visited there a few weeks ago. Got to see some. And then, of course, our target dates sometime in the next decade, getting them to a sustainable population size. And I have, even though I said I was going to be early, I have managed to go one minute over time. <laughs> this is the long now view of extinction. This is what we want to do. And with that, we'll go to questions.
Brilliant. Thank you, Ben. So while you are all thinking of your questions, I have one for Ben. And I think it's very amusing that you think that we hired you because of your passenger pigeon DNA, when we really Don't. hired you because we knew you were hardwired to bring back the passenger pigeon. So why is that? It's, it's because there was no one else crazy enough to commit yeah, but, 30 but years. Seriously, Ben, why are you passionate about this? Where does that come from? Well, I'll make a plug for Maureen O'Connor right now. Maureen O'Connor Maureen O'Connor wrote a book called Resurrection Science, which is a chapter about this project, and she has, has a very good personal treatment of me. Um, and it, it basically, if you read anything in media articles, they'll say that I loved these birds since I was very young. Uh, my grandfather had birds growing up, and I, I got bit with the pigeon bug early. And when I was 13 years old, I thought that de-extinction was the logical next step for conservation. I grew up, I should premise this, I grew up in western North Dakota, about an hour from Theodore Roosevelt's ranches in the Badlands. Now, to me, that area is the true mecca of conservation in national parks, not Yellowstone, because it was there that Theodore Roosevelt became a conservationist, inspired by that landscape. That's what I grew up in. And growing up there, we learned a very great deal, not about how pristine nature is, but how managed it is and how much people are involved in the land. And, and so for me, the idea of ecological restoration going to extinct species was the next step. Things like putting wolves in Yellowstone, that's de-extinction. Beavers in Scotland, that's de-extinction. It's just not to the point that we can do with this technology. And so I wanted to pursue it, and I fell in love with it. And we're glad you did. First question, I uh, think. Oh, yeah, and actually, right. Ryan, I, I, I want to first of all uh, introduce the other co-founder of Revive and Restore, Ryan Phelan, who's uh, going to be running Q&A for us. I have a quick question from the stream, and then we'll, uh, we'll get to the question right over here. Um, what is the likelihood that Revive and Restore will be allowed to release a significant population of passenger pigeons into the wild, and what is the legality of this? So... This is a question we have been looking into since we started this work. Um, and what can be definitively said right now is that there is no regulatory policy that absolutely prohibits us from doing so, but there's no regulatory policy that absolutely allows us to. So, so some reworking of policy is necessary. And that's where it comes down to our supporters. The only way we're really going to advocate and get strong support for these projects in the regulatory framework is if the public comes out and says they want this to happen. Public opinion shapes how the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service operates, 100%. More so than the scientists involved. Um, now, I can tell you that if people are going to eat them someday, it'll be regulated by no. the FDA. <laughs> yes, yes, it will be. Um, now, the, there's a transgenic American chestnut right now that's going through the regulatory process that will be the world's first genetically modified organism that could be approved for wild release. Um, and so we view this as a very, very fruitful time to be thinking about these projects and helping to go through and think about beyond a plant, how do you regulate an animal? Now, Revive and Restore's Black-Footed Ferret Project stands to be the first project to engineer the cells of an endangered mammal in the world. And we're doing this under the auspices of permissions, permissions in certain ways from the program and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So we view these as projects that will help build the regulatory framework. And even though regulation seems to go slowly, I think there's high likelihood that when we have enough birds to put in the wild, we will be allowed to put these birds in the wild. But that, that depends on public support. All right, go ahead. So you said that you only need about 10,000 of these birds to make the ecological change that you're looking for versus the 100,000 or millions of birds. How are they going to do the damage or restorative in that pack? So, so that might have come off confusing. 10,000 is the number of birds that, that, is, that is sustaining or, or can survive in the wild without blinking out. It, it, it's highly unlikely 10,000 birds will make an ecological blip. Um, it's more likely that we have to get up to a million or more birds. And the more birds you have, the, the larger region you get to cover with that. That's something we're trying to look into. We, re we really don't know the density of birds needed to, to break tree branches. And, and this is something anyone could do in their backyard. Please do it. Um, <laughs> we have a guy in Massachusetts, and he's been doing this for a year and a half. And I said, could you just weigh down branches and figure out how much weight you need to break it? And he went out, and he made little bags, passenger pigeons of sand, based on their average weight. And he put them up with hooks. And the branches bent all the way down to the ground. They didn't break. 
And then so he put on more, and he's like, okay, so this is passenger pigeons on top of each other's backs, and they didn't break. And he thought, well, maybe it's because the branches were too low, right? He's short, so they were hitting the ground. So he then went out with a bow and arrow and shot up over <laughs> arrows, and he couldn't do it with, with, so he got a barrel, and he put water in the barrel and went until it broke, and he finally broke one. Um, but, you know, we need more replicates of this. We need to figure out what is the density needed so we can start scaling this. Can you imagine what this guy's neighbors thought? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this yeah. is what happens when you get volunteers riding Revive and Restore saying they want to help. Yeah. All right, next question. Yeah, so the, the environment that you're going to be releasing these pigeons into has been pretty radically, uh, radically altered from what they would have lived in in, you know, before humans expanded, you know, or before Europeans expanded west into uh, uh, the Americas. Um, is there any evidence that they'll resume the same ecological niche that they had um, well, when, when they lived in... Well, the only way there would be evidence is by putting them back. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, ultimately, the ecological niche is based on density, population mm -hmm. density. So this is something that we will we'll be able to we'll be able to get the first glimpses at in captivity. If the birds are not densely flocking or, or socializing, then they'll never recapitulate that, and we haven't got there yet. So before we ever bother releasing to the wild, we want to see that they are densely socializing in captivity, differently than other birds. Um, and if they can do that, they will resume that role. Now we we get this question a lot from ecologists, people, and this is because of the old narrative of the passenger pigeon. The old narrative was that it was a bird that had preferences for one habitat versus another, and that because the habitat was changed, it wasn't going to work. But because of our new data, there, it's absolutely impossible for them to have a preference for one forest habitat over another and have that population curve, because the forest is different today than it was 100 years ago, but they were abundant 10,000 years ago and 20,000 years ago, and those forests were nothing like they were in the 1800s. So the habitat they were breeding in most commonly in, in 1860 didn't exist 14,000 years ago, but there were just as many birds. So these are, these are birds that just seamlessly move from one habitat type into another as climate is changing it and other species are changing it, and they're playing a role as the ecosystem engineer for whatever dominant tree type is there. Ben, I like it um, when you describe them as opportunists because I think most people think about um, the birds that they see as being hardwired to migrate certain places yeah. for certain crops at certain times of the year. And the passenger pigeon was really was different. Not. Yeah, it was, it's one of the few bird species in the world that is nomadic. So even though the name is Migratorius, which is kind of redundant, uh, so its name, Ectopistes Migratorius, means the, the wandering migrator, <laughs> um, and they don't migrate, that's just the thing. Migration is a bird or a species going from one set ge geographic location to another set geographic location at the same time every year without a miss. Maybe you'll have a screwy one that goes off somewhere else, but the species does that. And that's why climate change is such a huge deal, rapid climate change to some species, because as they go back to that same geologic, uh, geographic location, it's now a different habitat. Passenger pigeons aren't like that. Um, when you go through the records in Shorter's book, there's records of them being in New York in December and January, or Michigan in April or February, or Mississippi at the same months as those. They're, they're nomadically going wherever they want. And so as things change, they're free to go wherever it's, wherever it's good. Question from Izzy? Uh, well, I think you answered it already, Ben. I was going to ask whether the missing uh, chestnut from the American woods would make enough difference alone because they were so dominant for so much yep. of the century. So our dietary century. research shows that they definitely were capable of eating chestnuts. Now, I, that was shocking to me because I originally came in thinking they, they didn't eat chestnuts. They're big. Yeah, you look at them and they're, they're big. Um, but it's possible, and, and the thing is, in historic records, there's no field observation of a passenger pigeon eating a chestnut. And there's only a single chestnut ever found in a gut cavity. And so I believe there is something happening that they're not eating chestnuts the way they were. And this would make sense, and I'll say this because I didn't show it in here, but diet was a huge component of my master's thesis. Passenger pigeons most likely destroyed everything they ate. They didn't, when, when, they, when they get rid of it, on the other end, there were no intact seeds. Chestnuts were the most abundant tree, while the passenger pigeons were abundant. There were maybe three billion chestnuts when there were three billion passenger pigeons. Well, there cannot be three billion prey in the face of three billion predators. That's 100% impossible in every ecosystem on the planet. Therefore, 
chestnuts had to be evading passenger pigeon consumption somehow. Uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, potentially uh, unintended consequences? I could think of three things off the bat. Uh, one of them is that um, birds carry diseases. Another is that big flocks of birds fly into airplanes and make them crash. A third is uh, Alfred Hitchcock's movie, The Birds. Which <laughs> <laughs> and my mom brings that the one up. Bay. Um, so yeah, I'll, and I'll offer a few more. Um, so, <laughs> so evaluating risk is something very important, and it's why, important, uh, why management is, is very important. So there's no evidence that our new birds could fly all the way west and interact with band-tailed pigeons, but let's assume they do. Let's assume a few of our new passenger pigeons cross the Great Plains and the mountains and they meet some band-tailed pigeons, and our traits that we've engineered are so successful that all band-tailed pigeons in the west over several generations become passenger pigeons, and we've caused the extinction of the <laughs> band-tailed pigeon as it was. That's something to worry about. It's unlikely to happen ecologically, and it's something we need to maintain and manage. Um, as far as those other things, I mean, you know, if they become too abundant, the thing to remember, and it's something we don't like thinking about, but hunting in the United States is a conservation tool. And I already know lots of people who want to hunt passenger pigeons when they can someday. <laughs> the extinction of this species happened with muzzle-loading shotguns. We can keep them in check today. <laughs> They're not an outbreak species that's, that's going to get out of hand. Um, what were you hunting last week? I was hunting elk last week. And the day after I left, my dad bagged a big one. <laughs> Archery. We're traditional archers. So. The, the airplanes. So the airplanes landing and taking off would be a risk. Um, we all know that the one plane that the movie is about right now, Sully, hit birds. Um, one good thing about passenger pigeons and band tail pigeons today, too, is that they're fairly reclusive birds that prefer, and you might not believe this because you'll see band tail pigeons in your backyard, but breeding flocks of band tail pigeons prefer remote habitat. So it's unlikely that large flocks will be really near airports and urban areas a great deal, but they're also a low flying bird, so for high flying planes, they're not necessarily a risk. Um, but once again, that's something that has to be managed, but that's not something that's difficult once they're abundant. And here's what I'll say. Passenger pigeons pose more risk when they're rare than when they're abundant. It's this sweet spot. Think about it this way. The birds come in, they destroy forest, and they poop a lot. What if that happens to Central Park, New York? No one's going to like that. But I've calculated that nearly something like 300 or 400 million birds could nest in Central Park, New York. But Central Park, New York, is hundreds of miles from available food. They cannot raise young there at saturation. So if, when we create a flock that's larger than saturation, it can no longer live in Central Park, and it won't go there. So we need to create a flock that's large enough to where they cannot utilize human-made habitats the way rarer birds could. And that'll be the key thing, is abundance. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, you um, obviously are working on the scientific side of this, but I take it that you work with historical ecologists as well to understand the, the ecology of previous generations. And I'm wondering how much of that knowledge comes from indigenous populations who have lived you know, pre-European invasion in the environments that we're talking about when these birds were clearly just as abundant as they are now. And what has that evidence said about the kinds of ecologies in which they live and what trees, for example, they've been crashing to the ground. So that is sadly something we haven't gotten to do yet. Um, this is partially because uh, we haven't been able to talk to a lot of those uh, researchers who work with indigenous peoples. I, would wa I actually want to, I've, I've called, uh, I've finally gotten in contact with one of the First Nations tribes that has an intimate history with passenger pigeons uh, to start this dialogue. Um, also because I feel they can be strong allies for the future of this project. This was their bird for 10,000 years before it was ours. And what is known in the published passenger pigeon literature is very, very little. Um, it's almost like everything that indigenous peoples ever knew about the birds was wiped off the face of the planet when their cultures were nearly decimated. So hopefully we can learn some new insights from, from the indigenous peoples. But right now it's just been going through literature to try and identify who would we even talk to 
um, and if there's anyone else, anyone alive that, that would have any connection to that. All right, last question from me. Ben, uh, you've just completed your master's. You've shown us your last four years of work. Thank you very much. What happens next for you? Well, uh, on October 31st, so work starting tomorrow, I will be applying for a scholarship to go to Australia for a PhD. And this is not to be a student in the way that I was here. Because I actually, uh, uh, I'll admit, I really hate grad school. I do. I hate every aspect of it. Um, and I think the American graduate school system is a sham taking advantage of students. So, <laughs> but the best, best science comes out of it. I'm not saying it's horrible. But uh, when, when Tim Duran, a scientist at a government lab in Australia, approached me, he loves our project. He wants to see it go forward. And his lab works on, on engineering birds. And they want to go beyond the chicken. They want to go to the pigeon. And he said, you know, if you came down here, we could put some Australian money into it. And we could get something This going. is Melbourne? Near Melbourne. It's near Melbourne. Geelong. That's how they say it. Geelong, Victoria. So I went down there in February, and I trained. And so the idea of being a student there is that by being a student, we can get scholarship money to then supplement the project in Australia. Um, and it will bring me down there, because that's a government lab. They can't just hire me. But they can, they can allow students to be hosted. And I said, when he first said, come down and do a PhD, I said, no. <laughs> I said, nope. I don't need one. I don't care. I've gotten this far without one. Um, and he said, oh, no, it's different down here. You don't have to take any classes. And I said, sign me up. <laughs> All right, to be continued. Yeah, so, so uh, Stuart, do you want to come up? I want to get the photo op of the whole Revive team up here uh, with, with our auto drawing of the, the passenger pigeon. Um, and uh, Ryan, I think you've got a, a little presentation. Oh, that's a better slide. All right. Um, so for Ben, on behalf of Long Now, the board, the members, and Revive and Restore, a challenge coin for you. Oh, no. Thank you all.